No Small Potatoes, Junius G. Groves and His Kingdom in Kansas. One potato, two potato, 30, 11 million potatoes? Is that how many potatoes Junius George Groves grew? No, not 30, 11 million, not exactly. But he, Junius G for short, he sure grew piles and piles of spuds. So many that he was crowned the Potato King, a legend known far and wide. Folks were doubly amazed when they heard about Junius G's bleak beginnings in the bluegrass state. No crown, no kingdom, not an inch of ground. When baby Junius G first laid eyes on the world, he had nothing to call his own. Legally, not even himself. He was born into slavery on a plantation near Greensburg, Kentucky. Thank goodness Junius G didn't stay in slavery for a long, long time. He was yet young when freedom came. That happened when America abolished slavery in late 1865. Junius G. didn't stay in the bluegrass state for a long, long time either. In 1879, when he was about 20, he left taking part in an ever-growing exodus, the great going out, a great going away. I worked around for planters here and there and managed to pick up a little reading and figuring in a log schoolhouse at Columbia, Kentucky. Junius G. in 1905. From Kentucky... Tennessee and other southern states, tens of thousands of people, mostly country folk, and a host with youngsters in tow, shook the dust from their feet. Exodusters, they were called. With hearts hugging hope, clutching dreams of bountiful lives, exodusters went west to the plains. Land was plentiful there, they heard. For many, that place of promise was Kansas, the Sunflower State. Exodusters journeyed by steamboat, by train, in bumpity-bump ox carts, in wide-wheeled wagons. Some of those keen on Kansas put down their roots in new towns, like Nicodemus. Others settled in or near Topeka and Kansas City. Both of these burgs were along the Kansas River, also known as the Caw. As for Exodester Junius G., they say that he walked to Kansas more than 500 miles. Along the way, he worked odd jobs. Junius G. ended his journey in the Great Caw Valley in a part of Kansas City, Kansas, bound by an oxbow bend in the Caw. This place was soon called Armadale. There, Junius G. landed a job on a potato farm for a lowly 40 cents a day. Junius G. could so easily have pitied himself over his piddling pay, but he didn't. Instead, he made up his mind to just work hard. A few moons later, Junius G. got a raise in pay to 75 cents a day, and he kept working hard, so hard that the man for whom he worked, J.T. Williamson, made him foreman of his farm. With that came another raise, 50 more cents a day. It was several weeks before I could get work on a farm, and when I finally did secure a place, it was at almost starvation wages, 40 cents per day. This was better than being fo forced to roam the streets and beg, so I gladly accepted the offer, determined to work my way up to better things. By keeping my eyes open, always attending to duty and doing more, rather than less than what was required of me, I soon succeeded in having my wages raised. Junius G. in 1900. Still, Junius G. wanted more, and not just more money. He dreamed of farming for himself. Lacking the bucks to buy some land, he did the next best thing. He rented land from J.T. Williamson, nine acres. For use of his land, his tools, and his team, Junius G. agreed to pay J.T. with a share of the crops. Junius G. planted white potatoes on one-third of those nine acres. In time, Junius G. was renting 20 acres, then 66 acres, growing more and more spuds, and he kept hoping for a farm of his own. Hoping alongside him was Matilda E. Stewart, 
the woman he married about a year after he reached Kansas. Just like Junius G., Matilda E. was no lazy bones. She didn't hiccup and holler at the hint of hard work. With Matilda E., his steady, sturdy helpmate, Junius G. kept working hard, day after day, dawn to dusk. Come true dark, the couple slept away a day's weary in a one-room shack. Week after week, Junius G. and Matilda E. put off purchasing trifles and trinkets. They only bought needful things. That way, they could save up every spare dollar, dime and nickel. Every spare penny, too. This money came from the crops they sold and from other work they did on the side, such as chopping firewood in the winter to sell to town folk. All that working and saving up paid off. In late 1884, Junius G. had his eyes on 80 acres. This land was east of Edwardsville, near the mouth of the Caw, its banks lined with cottonwood trees. Junius G. and Matilda E. had saved up $2,200, but those 80 acres near Edwardsville cost $3,600. Where would the $1,400 difference come from? The wind? A cloud? Some magic tree? No siree, it would come from hard work. That's what Junius G. believed when he handed over those 2,200 bucks. With it was the promise to pay off the balance in a year. Right quick, Junius G. went to work turning those 80 acres into a real farm. There's a small house to build. More daunting than that was the back straining, muscle taxing task of clearing the land. For starters, digging up up teen tree stumps so many as to make for stepping stones up and down a field. And while Junius G. was doing all that, the top crop on his mind? Potatoes. But could he do it? Could he farm hard enough to pay off the money he still owed on those 80 acres in a year? If he didn't, he was liable to lose the land and those 2,200 bucks. Negative natterings of naysaying neighbors snaked their way to Junius G's ears. He did a dumb deal, these people humphed. He would never pay off that debt in a year, they tut-tutted. When they looked into Junius G's for future, those naysaying neighbors saw nothing but failure. The negative natterings kicked up a ruckus in Junius G's head, made him sad, scared, down, discouraged. It wasn't like he had only himself to worry about. There was Matilda E. What's more, the couple had three young sons by then, Charles, Walter, and Fred, stair-step kids. Maybe those neighbors were right, feared Junius G. Maybe he had dreamed too big, bitten off more than he could chew. What to do? Keep working hard. Planting, plowing, tilling, hilling, hoping for right rain. Watching potato vines grow, then waiting for their blooms. Keeping his courage up under the searing sun in the face of hot, heavy winds. Plus, Junius G had to be ever ready to battle blister beetles, roly-polies, and other potato pests. Come harvest time, more hard work. Working hard worked. True to his word, Junius G paid off the money he owed in a year. It was pretty risky business paying out every dollar we had saved by five years hard work and close living, and running ourselves $1,400 in debt, but we wanted a home of our own. And I knew that I should should succeed much better when I was tilling soil that I could call my own, Junius G in 1900. Once those 80 acres were really his, can you guess what Junius G decided to do? Keep working hard. In time, Junius G bought more land in the Great Caw Valley, all told more than 500 acres. And year after year, he kept working hard. So hard that in 1894, the Kansas Blackman called him the potato king of his county, which was Wyandotte. So hard that in 1900, the Indianapolis recorder hailed him the potato king of the whole Sunflower State. Then, in 1902, Junius G. was crowned potato king of the world. He had grown 12,000 plus more bushels of potatoes than anybody else. How many potatoes had Junius George Groves grown that year? 
72,150 bushels, or about 4 million pounds of spuds. Put another way, roughly 12 million potatoes. Potato math, one bushel equals about 60 pounds. One pound equals about three potatoes. Judy's G spuds baked, boiled, fried, mashed, puffed, souped, diced for potato salad, sliced thin for chips, filled bellies around America. Loads cross the nation's borders, traveling by train up to Canada and down to Mexico. What with Junius G shipping such a multitude of spuds, a railroad company had built a special spur to his potato house. Even after all the fame, farmer Junius G kept working hard, kept loving his rich, dark earth, likening the furrows of his plows churned up to chocolate waves. While all those spuds grew year after year, so too did Junius G's family. A dozen little grovesies were born and raised to full grown on their parents' farm. As Charles, Walter, Fred, Ora, Ida, May, Lillian, Junius G Jr., Sylvester, Etna, John, Cornelius, and Theodore grew, they too learned the land. The hundreds of acres planted in potatoes, the parcels sown with other crops, like cabbage and carrots and corn. There were fruit trees too. So here we are, every one of my boys a farmer, every one of my girls married to a farmer, every man and boy of them in overalls and working hard. I want these boys and girls of mine to stay on the land. I want my children and grandchildren to always be able to stand up and say, we are part and parcel of that army of farmers which feeds America. Junius G in 1919. Over the years, the Potato King grew more than a big family more than cabbage and carrots and corn, more than fruit trees, more than potatoes. Junius G grew jobs, hiring farmhands. Junius G grew a park, Groves Park, and a church, Pleasant Hill Baptist, a store that sold groceries and other goods, a golf course too. Junius G also built bigger and bigger homes for his family, the last one, a 22-room red brick mansion. It had white stone trim, a red tile roof, and strong oak doors. A most marvelous room behind those doors was a ballroom, which doubled as a play palace when Junius G's children were young. The library was perhaps Junius G's favorite room, so full of books and booklets on every faucet of farming. Books and booklets he called his college along with all the acres he tilled, along with all the food he grew. And dawn to dusk on any given day, winter, spring, summer, fall, Junius G, the Potato King, could behold his Caw Valley Kingdom from the veranda of that red brick mansion with its white stone trim, red tile roof, and strong oak doors, his castle. The End <laughs>